Uh, thank you and welcome. Um, I know that the competition for today's panel includes being outdoors in the 80 degree sun in San Diego. So I'm going to still posit that you made the right choice, but I realized that was a hard choice. Thank you for joining me today. Um, so let's just start out with a basic question. How many of you love emojis? If you do, I want to hear a woohoo. Let's hear it. Emojis. <laughs> There we go. We love emojis, don't we? Emojis are an integral part of how we're talking to each other today. So um, today we're going to take a uh, fun look at uh, the legal aspects of using emojis, these uh, cute little things that have proliferated as part of our everyday communications. Um, we're going to start just by s defining some terms, uh, though you're probably all familiar with this. Emojis, of course, are the uh, graphical images that you can see up here. Uh, Facebook's most popular ones include things like the uh, 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 um, uh, uh, laughing with tears of joy and the hard eyes emoji. Uh, the word emoji comes from the Japanese word for picture word, and they have their roots in J J Japan. So, um, uh, so uh, uh, that's how we get the term emoji. They're in contrast to emoticons, which actually come from a completely different place. They're older school technology, and they're used by creating keyboard symbols um, that can create pictograms. So uh, I trust many of you use these over life, things like the smiley as a colon, dash, and parentheses. Or sometimes people do without the nose, but I prefer the nose. Um, and the word emoticon, uh, emoticon comes from the combination of emo emotion and icon. It's actually a happy coincidence that emoji and emoticon share the emo uh, phrase, but actually it's an accident. Um, a third category of uh, um, things that we could talk about are cow emojis. These are also from Japan. Um, and I trust many of you have seen this. Uh, what is this uh, particular uh, cow emoji? Shrug or whatever, right? This is what my kids show me every single day uh, when I talk to them. Um, and there's a whole different way, a uh, different range of different types of cow emojis. Uh, these are all different types of faces. Some of them are giving high fives to each other. Um, and here are some cute little animals, uh, very Japanese. Um, and uh, cow emojis are formed by using keyboard characters, but unlike the emoticon, which are also used, formed using keyboard characters, you don't have to turn your head to see them. They come straight at you, as opposed to being rotated to the left or to the right. Um, we're going to talk about emojis today, although emoticons are going to make another appearance. I don't have much to say about cow emojis. They only make one more appearance. Um, so here's how some of these might look uh, compared with each other. You can see you got the smiley, the neutral, and the sad, and you can see the different implementations. I love the Japanese sad. That's actually a really good visual metaphor. The T is the uh, eyes are crying, so the bottom of the T is the tears dropping down. Um, you have to be kind of familiar with the uh, cultural references to make it work. Um, so what we're going to do uh, is take a look at old school questions. We're going to start with a question about how emoticons have um, come up in uh, case law. And there are uh, dozens of emoticon cases, and most of them are older, and I'll show you that in a moment. Um, but let's just take a look how something like this presents itself, um, the legal questions. Um, so uh, here's an actual uh, snippet from a court opinion. Uh, it says, defense attorney's email uh, proposed, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the defense attorney emails the prosecutor and, and offers to, quote, stipulate that my client is guilty, colon, and parentheses. The client later comes back and says, uh, hey, um, by you stipulating, and I didn't give you consent, you violated my Sixth Amendment rights um, uh, for um, uh, ineffective assistance of counsel. Um, so what do we do with the colon and parentheses? Um, shout it out if you think you know what, whether this is a joke or something else. Uh, what do you think we should do with this? Any uh, thoughts? Get a new lawyer. So I presented this slide to a panel of judges, and when I got this far, you should have heard the gas from judges. What lawyer would do something as crazy as this? But you guys have seen worse. You know that, yeah? Well, it was really not a hard analysis. Quote, uh, no one took counsel's frivolous email as an actual stipulation. Everyone got the point that the colon and parentheses was a joke, and as a result, um, they didn't give credit to this, quote, offer that was going to wave away the client's rights and potentially send the client to jail. As it turns out, of course, the client did end up going to jail, um, so it didn't really matter, a big deal. Um, but uh, the point is, if the lawyer had actually stipulated to uh, guilty offer when the client 
Monahan agreed, the lawyer's probably going to have a pretty bad day, no? Um, so uh, the lawyer gets off the hook on this one as well. Um, so this is a very uh, uh, common type of thing that I see in looking at emoji case law. Um, people are just talking to each other, and up pops these uh, strange symbols, colon and parentheses. What do we do with that? How do we give that legal effect? We're going to talk more about that. Um, but in order to do that, we're going to go really deeper into this category of things called emojis. They're not all one size fits all, and so we have to understand the terminology better in order to make it work. Um, the emojis that you're familiar with are probably Unicode emojis. Unicode is the same people that create standardization for keyboard characters, so that when you type out a keyboard character on your operating system or platform, it shows up as the same keyboard character on somebody else's operating system or platform. So there's this cross-platform compatibility that's established by Unicode. What they do is that they create the symbol, the keyboard character, and then they create a unique code for that. And every time you type the symbol, you actually translate into a code. And then when that code shows up on the recipient side, they say, I know what symbol to present here. Now, users can modify this by using different typefaces. So you can have italics, or you can have it bold. You can also have it in times, or Helvetica. There are different ways to present the keyboard character. But the keyboard character is going to show up the same from platform A to platform B. As it cuts across the internet, as it's moving over electronic networks, you're always going to see the same symbol. Well, Unicode said, let's do the same thing for emojis. They're going to occupy the same place. We can have them so that each emoji that we define will have a unique uh, uh, identifier associated with it. And so every time someone uses emoji, that will translate into unique code defined by Unicode. When that sends over the network, the recipient network will say, I see this unique code. I'm going to show the same emoji. Same thing as the keyboard character A or the colon and parentheses that you saw in the uh, previous slide. But Unicode's implementation is not uniform. So because of the fact that they allow p uh, each uh, um, platform to define how the emoji looks on their platform, it turns out that it's only partially standardized. You'll still be getting the symbol that each platform defines as, say, the grinning face. However, that grinning face will look different on different platforms. And you can see it right up there. You can see the different implementations. Some of them have more well-defined teeth. Some of them don't. Some of them have thicker borders. Some of them don't. I'll show that on the next slide. Um, so most of the time when we talk about emojis, we're actually referring to Unicode emojis. That's how most people think about them, because they are the main set that we're using in most of the day-to-day -day communications that involve emojis. But because they're different, we get some really wonky results. So here's just three um, emojis that I picked at random. Uh, first one, uh, it, sorry, the resolution's not super great here, um, is showing up as uh, the, the cow emoji, not the cow emoji that I talked about earlier, the COW emoji. Um, and you can see that these don't look identical. You can see that some of them are brown, others are black and white. You can see that some of them are outlines cut away, others are rotated uh, partially towards the uh, camera. You can see that some have udders, some don't. Some have a bell, some have horns. They're all a little bit different, and I'll give you a hypotheses about why they're different soon, but recognize now when I send an, a cow emoji, I might see one of these depictions, the recipient might see one of the other ones. Or take the eagle emoji. Why does anyone need to depict an eagle emoji differently? You can see some of the emojis are in flight, others of them are just the head. You can see that some of them have uh, 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 bl brown uh, um, uh, feathers, others have black. Why are they different? And who thinks that we need different burrito emojis? That's the next one. Some of them are in foil. Some of them aren't. Some of them have guacamole. Some of them don't. Uh, some of them are rotated upper left to bottom right. Others are upper right to bottom left. Um, so whenever you're sending Unicode emojis, you might be sending something that looks different to the recipient. Maybe in ways that are material, maybe not. And I'll show you some examples of how they might be, um, uh, 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 how that might matter in a bit. Okay, so um, there are other types of emojis. So you may be familiar with proprietary emojis. These are often called stickers. 
Um, and proprietary emojis, they're only going to be sent within a single platform. So if you pick one of Facebook's stickers and then try and send it off of Facebook, something bad's going to happen. Odds are it won't come through. It's going to be treated like a graphical file, but the system that receives it might not know what to do with it. So you might get a big box, a white box or a black box or a box with an X that might signal that there was something there, but the recipient system didn't know what to do with it. So Unicode emojis are designed to travel across platforms. The proprietary emojis or stickers are not designed to travel across platforms. There are other kinds of emoji-like things. So some of you may be familiar with the an emoji. Uh, this is a way where you can use something like the fox emoji, and then you can actually have it replicate your facial expressions and head movements. Or you can have the, um, uh, the me emoji, where you can do the same thing with all the facial expressions and head movements, but then you can actually customize the emoji so it looks more like you. You can see you can create skin uh, or hairstyle or freckles. You can personalize that emoji so that it actually represents something that you want to signal. It could be a faithful depiction of you. It could be completely fanciful. And then there's also the Samsung AR emoji, which is the same kind of thing as the, um, uh, the an emoji, except it's the whole body. So now you get the whole grooving going on as well as the facial expressions. Um, we're not going to talk about the different animated emojis, um, but they're an integral part of thinking about emoji law because when you think about emojis, you're normally thinking of static graphical images. But as you can see, people are calling things that actually move as emojis, and those are going to have qualitatively different properties. So for example, I would think of these as short videos that are scripted or, or funneled through some wizards that control what you can do with the videos, but they're still like short videos, and you should think of them from an evidentiary standpoint in the same category. Okay, um, so now we're going to start talking about some law of emojis. Um, now that we've defined our terms, let's talk about law, uh, the intellectual property laws of emojis. Um, so the, the, the first thing to take away is that emojis uh, are eligible for copyright protection. They can be eligible at the individual emoji level, and they can be eligible for copyright protection at the emoji set level. So you can have a, a copyright that covers the entire set, as well as copyrights for individual emojis. Now, the individual emojis might be a little bit wonky as well. So take the upper left emoji. This is the eyes without a mouth emoji. Um, in the context of emojis, there's probably only so many ways to depict that particular emoji. And in that circumstance then, it's probable that that's going to drop out of copyright law. And any of the copyright wonks who want to talk to me about that, I'm happy to get you through the analysis. But let's assume for a moment that the eyes without a mouth is probably not going to be eligible to copyright. But the clown emoji or the stadium emoji, they probably have enough expressive details that they're going to clear the bar in order to be eligible for copyright protection. And we actually know that emoji, individual emojis are are and are, are, are eligible for copyright protection and are being treated as such because there are hundreds if not thousands of registrations for emojis in the U.S. Copyright uh, Office. So, for example, Apple is notorious about this. Um, you can see just a small sampling of some of the emoji registrations that they've got. They've got, I think, about 1,500 last time I had checked. So, um, uh, so emojis are eligible for copyright protection, and in fact, they are being registered on a fairly regular basis nowadays. Um, emojis are also eligible for trademark protection and are, could be part of a design patent. And we have examples of these things as well. So for example, um, the emojis could be something like a key emoji. You don't even have to call it an emoji. You could just have a key logo and that would look the same. So when you think about different types of logos that people have, they've got all kinds of logos that might overlap with the subject matter of typical emojis. Um, but then you also have registrations like this one down here, this unhappy face, which is just a straightforward unhappy face, right? There's nothing fancy about that. Um, and that was registered not as emoji, just as an unhappy face, but it would overlap identically with an unhappy face emoji. Um, and if you do that kind of analysis, there's going to be dozens or hundreds of precedents in the database of trademark registrations that have been acquired for things that we would consider to be nowadays as emojis. Um, and uh, this is an example of a design patent that was registered. Uh, this is a, a very a standard emoji face depiction. Um, and it's put on, um, in this case, it was a balloon. Um, so you get the design patent for the balloon with an emoji depiction, and that can be eligible for uh, design patent protection. Um, and there are, I, that's really hard for me to track, but there are dozens, if not hundreds, of those as well. Um, 
So what you could take away from the IP discussion is that there's an entire thicket of uh, protection for individual emoji depictions that are in the registration databases as well as possibly in some cases covered by common law. Um, and that creates this really messy thicket for anyone who wants to try and uh, come up with new emojis or to recycle somebody else's emoji in something that they're doing. Uh, they have to navigate this thicket. Um, and we can cover that in the Q&A if you want. Let's talk about emojis in court. So uh, I track every emoji case that I can find, um, and I'm not perfect at it uh, for reasons that I'm going to explain in just a moment. Um, and here's the chart of what I'm seeing so far. This chart uh, goes up through the end of uh, 2018, um, and uh, the exponential growth has just continued. Uh, so far in 2019, we have about 80 new emoji and emoticon cases. So it's building that classic J curve of growth um, that you would expect to see. Um, and you can see that the first emoticon depiction that I have goes back to 2004. Um, but, the, uh, but you can see that emoticons kind of waxed, and then they've been on the wane. So uh, nowadays, I don't see emoticons very often in court cases. Um, it's definitely on the decline. And in fact, usually when I see emoticon referenced in cases, the court meant emoji. So they'll be talking about an emoticon. That wouldn't be the kind of thing you could form with the keyboard characters. It's actually an emoji. They just are using the language in interchangeably. You can see, however, that emojis have come out of nowhere. The first emoji case that I can find is in 2014. Um, I'm sorry, all this in the U.S. I apologize to the Canadian friends that we have here in other uh, countries. Um, but the first one I can find in the U.S. Uh, is in 2014, and then you can see it's exponentially growing. Um, and almost all the references I have in 2019 are emojis, either actually or they're emoticon. They, they use the term emoticon, uh, but they weren't. Um, but they were actually emojis. Um, so emojis have uh, taken over. They're going to be an integral part of our case law going forward, and we're going to see them increasingly frequently. Now, the way I build this data set is by doing Lexis and uh, Westlaw searches for the keywords emoji and emoticon. I can't search for the actual depictions of emojis and emoticons. I can only search for the words. So there are certainly other cases that are going to be um, uh, in the database or uh, that were uh, issued that I can't find because they actually use the symbol and I can't search for that. So this is actually suppressed number than the real number because of the limits of searching. Um, I will also add uh, that um, uh, it's depressed because so many cases never show up in Westlaw or Lexis. So, for example, um, many of you may have re read news reports about um, uh, people being prosecuted for using emojis, like having three pistol emojis aiming at, a, 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 at the police officer emoji. Um, those kinds of situations um, often don't get into the database, but they're actually happening as well. So it wouldn't surprise me if many of you are now encountering emojis in the field in your practice because of the fact that they're such an integral part of communication and um, people are getting into trouble using them. Um, so I mentioned that I can only do the search for the keyword emoji and the keyword emoticon, and not the actual ones themselves. Uh, there was a paper that just came out from a uh, law librarian at Duke, uh, Jennifer Behrens, I think is how you pronounce it, who tried to actually find cases and uh, law review articles that had the uh, emoji or emoticons in them. And so she created a data set of cases and articles that had the emojis or emoticons in them, and then tried to pull them up and see if they were properly depicted in various different databases. The things you can take away, the cow emojis are just an outright strikeout, right? Courts can't handle the cow emojis at all. Um, <laughs> And in the case law, you can see that um, the numbers are actually not terrible, right? You can see that they were handled properly in terms of depicting or, sh or indicating them in a pretty good number of the cases, um, and uh, even better with the um, uh, emoticons. Um, and yet, uh, most of the cases that I see, and I'll give you, uh, I think I took it out. Uh, I, uh, most of the cases I see, the courts don't actually depict the emojis, and in many cases, they don't pick the emoticons. They will literally put in something that says, emoji omitted or something like that. So it's not even searchable, even if I had the technological tools to do so, I couldn't search for it because it literally doesn't show up in the electronic version of the opinion. Now, if you're working at any of the places on the left, I beg you, let's do better with making it so that I can actually search for emojis or emoticons. That's an integral part of how we're talking together. Your search tools can't handle it. The emoticons, those are like some of the Boolean connectors. So when you put it in, it doesn't like that at all. 
all. Um, it just doesn't search. And of course, you can't do graphical searches on either uh, the main databases. Uh, one last little factoid for you about litigation. Um, here's, I tried to do, this is like totally hacked. You know that. Um, the data set's all messy. But I tried to put together what emojis actually had shown up in court opinions, either expressly or by reference. Um, and so here's what I came up with. Not surprisingly, the face emojis make the biggest appearance. Um, and uh, then you can see the next one is gun. And then if you look below, you'll see other stuff that shows up are knives, bombs, fists. So we love each other or we hate each other. That's pretty much how it goes with emojis. Um, and uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, one of the reasons why the face emojis show up so often is the, the number one category of cases that reference emojis or emoticons, it's not a majority, but let's say it's roughly 25%, involve sexual predation cases. And so these are people, usually older male, trying to solicit sex from a younger female, and there's, or a law officer pretending to be a younger female. Um, and there's a lot of what I'm gonna call, for lack of a better term, flirtatious chatter that takes place in the sexual predation cases. And so in those moments where you have that kind of flirtatious chatter, those are the kinds of circumstances that create the possibility for emojis or emoticons. So it's not surprising, face emojis are among the most used, but they're also going to show up in litigation most heavily because of the nature of the cases where they show up. I'm going to spend uh, much of the rest of my time here talking about interpreting emojis. Um, and uh, this is such a fit, rich, fascinating topic. What do we do with these emojis that are in uh, these communications? How do we understand them? I already gave you one example with the emoticon. And most of you had no problem saying, of course, that was supposed to signal a joke, a terrible joke that the client wasn't laughing at, but still intended to signal a joke. We all got that. Um, so let's start with the basic premise here, that common law courts over the last hundreds of years have de developed a lot of tools to interpret new technological ways that people can communicate with each other. That's not new for the courts. The particular technology might be new, but the coping mechanism with new technological ways of communicating with each other are uh, something that courts have wrestled with for centuries. And so as a result, the standard hypothesis going into an emoji case is all the things that I learned from ye old days, the 17th century English cases, can still apply in this context as well. We know what to do when we see different ways of people communicating to each other. The question is, is there something unique, special, or different about emojis? Now, that's what I'm going to turn to, and I want to make an aggressive argument here. And it's aggressive only because this is the kind of stuff you as lawyers are going to stress test. I'm going to argue to you that there are some things that are unique, special, and different about emojis that pose some interpretive challenges. But I have to make that case to you. I can't just simply assert that. And one of the ways in which I got into the law of emojis was that it's the kind of thing we do with internet law generally. I've been doing internet law for 25 years. And the main question that we ask with internet law is, is there something unique, special, or different about the internet or some subset of that technology? That's the standard thing that we do when, we, when law, internet law professors get together and geek out. We say, hey, is there anything unique, special, or different in here? Um, same thing with emojis. And so I'm going to argue to you that though we have a, a great history of um, of to developing tools to, to, to cope with new ways of communicating with each other, we still might run into some things that are unique, special, different about emojis. Let's take a look at what some of those, what those might be. First, there's just the, the uh, visual decoding challenge of emojis. Now, some of you are millennials. Maybe we even got some Gen Z here. You have better eyes than I do. But my Gen Xer eyes, when I look at a screen, often have a difficult time of being able to figure out which emoji is even being used. In some cases, it's hard or impossible for me to blow up the screen on my phone to actually see it in a larger size, and I have to guess. And so I gave you an example here of the smiling eyes with open mouth and, um, I'm sorry, smiling face, open mouth, smiling eyes, smiling face, open mouth, and cold sweat. You can see that they are identical except for the little bead of sweat that's in the upper right of the circle. Now, on my uh, phone, that could look like a speck of dust. Do you know what I'm saying? And so one of the ways in which we could have an interpretive challenge is that literally people might decode the emojis differently. Sender meant this one. Recipient thought they were getting that one because they had a speck of dust in the wrong place. That would be a problem that we would have to resolve. 
Now, we have some interpretive tools to do that. Don't get me wrong. But this is something that's a little bit different. An A is not likely to look different than an A between sender and recipient. Um, but here, we might have that problem where we can't even figure out what letter is being used. And a lot of emojis are about perspective, how people see things. Now, when I presented this one to the judges, they really hated this slide. This slide went over like a lead balloon. They could not imagine that the face depiction was not the round dots being the eyes. But it is possible, and perhaps even plausible, that the dots are the nostrils and that the things above the dots are the eyes. Do you remember like in how the Cars movie, the eyes were the window shade as opposed to the headlights? Everyone expected them to be the headlights and they were the, uh, the windshield. Um, so we could have a situation like that where the dots are the nose, the mouth is the same, the eyes are above it. If you look at the emoji that way, you're gonna see the emoji totally differently. And sadly, I've ruined this emoji for you. You will always look at it that way again and say, wait, which way did they mean there? Those nose uh, dots or eye dots? Um, and so again, if you go through the exercise of then taking a look at all these where the slashes above the dots are the eyes, it all goes to heck. It doesn't make any sense. So the judges said, there's only one way to look at these emojis. And my job to them was to say, actually, you know, as crazy as it might be, there might be a community of people who view it the other way, and you need to be prepared for that. And in a situation like that, again, we have common law tools to handle that, but we have to at least recognize the possibilities. Let's try this one. Um, person with folded hands emojis. Um, and actually, this one did not come out quite right. This was not meant to have the same thing twice. I actually had the Unicode outline, and the, uh, the technology swapped out on me here. Um, what, do the, what does the, this symbol stand for? Shout it out, please, loud and proud, so all your peers can hear you. Pray? Pray? What else? I well, OK. What? I must it. What? Nam namaste, yes. What else? Uh, thank you. Yes. What else? High five. High five. What else? Anything else? Please. Absolutely. Okay. This one symbol is designed to, to stand for multiple uh, things. I think you guys got everything I had here. Yeah. Um, Unicode designs its emojis so that they have multiple meanings. When they adopt new emojis, they view that as a feature because they don't want to have dedicated single purpose emojis because then those emojis are not going to get used very frequently. They're only used for that one purpose. But multi-purpose emojis can be used across multiple different conversations and that makes the emojis more valuable. There are roughly, let's say, the specific number for a moment, 3,000 Unicode defined emojis. There are not all the different things that we might recognize as communicative symbols. So they want to allocate those scarce resources in the highest value way. The highest value way? multiple meanings. Well, guess what? Lawyers think about multiple meanings. We view this as a bug, yes? This means that ambiguity is built into the emojis from day one. By design, they are meant to have multiple conflicting meanings. And as a result, that means we're going to have to have a conversation with almost all these emojis. Which one of these did you mean? We can't presume anything. Now, that might be true when it comes to things like words, interpreting words. I would say that this might be a little bit more um, Wild Westy because of the fact that it's the ambiguity is built into the design. Um, OK, so um, like every other type of communication, whatever it is, there is slang. And there's lots of slang that's developed about emojis. And the point is, you probably don't know. So here's some of the things you might be saying when you think that you're sending these innocuous things. So you might be sending the snowflake. And you might be actually telling your communication partner that you want to get high. Um, or you might be sending the, um, uh, the uh, exhaust emoji. And that might be also saying, let's go take a smoke. Um, and you might be sending the Canadian uh, maple leaf. And actually, that might be interpreted as marijuana. Um, so there are all these slang that's developed. And of course, every communicative tool is going to have a slang about drugs. Come on, you know? Um, but we have to now be make sure that we don't overassume what any particular emoji means, because there's a subset of users who are using it for something very different. And we can really see that when we talk about the um, sex trafficking slang. So uh, there's a slang for people who are looking for uh, commercial sex 
or who are offering commercial sex, including commercial sex that might involve sex trafficking victims. Um, and so you can see, for example, uh, the rose is a common metaphor in this uh, commercial sex community for payment or dollars. So a price may be quoted as 100 roses when it's really meant to be $100. It's just a rose um, symbol has been co-opted that way. Um, but you can take it like something like the crown emoji. The crown emoji is used in the sex trafficking context as a uh, way of symbolizing that the person who's uh, depicted with the crown or wearing the crown is the king who would be the pimp and that they're subjugating some, uh, some commercial sex worker, that they're actually dominating or uh, controlling their actions. So... I don't feel comfortable using the crown emoji anymore. Uh, you know what I'm saying? It's like, wait, what am I saying? Am I saying crown in some sort of royalty sense? Or now I'm all suddenly uh, using codes for sex trafficking uh, that I had no intention. Now, slang is nothing unusual in any type of communication. Every hand symbol has slang. Every word that we use has slang. Um, every visual metaphor that we've developed develops slang. That's not unique. But here is something that is unique. And I'm going to go there, guys. You knew this was going to come up, but we're going to go there. We're going to talk about the peach and eggplant emoji. <laughs> when I presented this slide deck to judges, they thought this was, in fact, about peaches and eggplants. <laughs> the peach emoji is a uh, metaphor for tush or butt. The eggplant emoji, self-explanatory, is a metaphor for penis. Um, and the depictions give you those subtle visual clues. These are Apple's depictions of the Unicode emoji symbols for um, uh, for uh, peach and eggplant. Um, and neither of them look very similar to the actual Unicode design. Apple has embellished in ways that has created the sexual connotation where that wasn't a part of the Unicode version. And as a result, other platforms that implemented the peach and uh, eggplant emojis did not implement a way that had any suggestion that might be sexual. Um, in particular, the eggplant emoji, this is a Japanese eggplant, um, but the depicted uh, version uh, by Unicode is the bell-shaped or the, um, uh, the pear-shaped um, eggplant. Um, I don't know what variation or variety that is. Um, you know, it's the dark purple one with a little um, uh, uh, crown stem um, that uh, uh, was actually just sitting squat. Um, and so somewhere along the way, Apple said, you know what, let's not do this, the, the, the squat emoji for eggplant, let's do the Japanese eggplant. And then this is what we get. Now, for a period of time, Apple's uh, emojis were, and I'm going to say uniquely, I have to put that in quotes because there were variations throughout, but were uniquely depicted in ways that created a sexual connotation which meant that when you use the peach and eggplant emoji on the Apple platform, then people kind of got the point pretty quickly. Oh, this is a reference to, to butter penis. But people on other platforms had no idea that the peach emoji stood for butt or that the eggplant emoji stood for penis because it didn't look that way on their platforms. So instead of forming slang that develops on a community-specific basis, like a geographic community, or on a language basis, or on some kind of physical space um, uh, boundary, we had slang that developed on a platform-specific basis. And that is something that is somewhat unique to emojis. And that's going to be a takeaway for all of you, which is you have to see the actual emoji that the sender sent and that the recipient got. Because if they don't look the same, then you've got the possibility that, in fact, um, there was a, a clear connotation on platform A, and that connotation got lost on platform B, and the parties miscommunicated with each other. So um, the platform-specific slang is something that I think is unique to emojis, and it's a critical part of my understanding. What do you do when you encounter emojis in your legal practice? You have to be prepared for the fact that what you're seeing on the screen might not be ten telling you everything you need to know. Another thing that's unique about emojis is that they play a diverse role, set of roles in communication. So most of the time, words are just words. The words in the sentence, we read it for its textual meaning. But emojis perform a wide variety of different functions in a communication. So for example, 
Um, emojis can act as word substitutes, where you literally so swa uh, swap out a word for an emoji. Like if you want to talk about peaches, you could include the peach emoji as a substitute. But they can also act as a reinforcement that they can say, you know what, um, I love you, and then you can put a heart afterwards. So it doesn't add anything new, it just, it just says, when I said love, I really, really meant it. They can also send a mixed message, kind of like the, uh, uh, the smiley emo emoticon did in the uh, case I gave you earlier, where you send one message with a text, you send another message with an emoji that cuts under, uh, that undercuts that message. So um, uh, you can imagine something like an eye roll emoji would do that in almost all circumstances. Whatever you said before wasn't meant to be taken at literal value, it was meant to be flipped on its head. Um, they can also act as compliments where they extend the communication, um, they add something more to the communication. This is like how you can add emotional context to, um, the, uh, uh, to a, a, a text message. Um, you can also use them for emphasis where you can really pound a particular message home. And then you can also use them for what um, the linguists sometimes call discourse management. This is the um, body language, the vocal inflections, the head nods, um, the facial expressions that we make when we're communicating face uh, to face with another person that tells them that things are going okay in the conversation. So it's not designed to do anything more than just to facilitate or keep the conversation going. Um, and so uh, uh, they're not um, uh, performing any other con uh, 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 substantive um, uh, uh, semantic role, they're simply acting as a way of keeping the conversation looking like it's still friendly, like you're still engaged, like you're actually still understanding your communication partner. So another thing that I think is unique about emojis is that emojis could be playing any of these six roles. And in fact, the same emoji could be playing all six of these roles in the same message. So you can't assume what role emoji is playing in a message because, in fact, there's no equation with that. You have to interpret it in the context of everything around it. And so the, the, the smiley emoji might be meant for discourse management. It might be meant as a, um, uh, as a word substitute. It might be meant as a uh, uh, mixed message to reflip or reverse whatever else is being said. Um, the same exact emoji performing multiple functions. This is something that, that courts aren't used to seeing because we don't have other communication symbols that generally would play that kind of role. And that's something that you can all be aware of when you're working with interpreting emojis. One other thing that um, I think is unique, because of the fact that emojis can play different roles in the same message, is that there's not a uniform grammar that's developed when you come to emoji sequences. We don't know how to um, sequence the emojis in ways that make sense. And so here's a study that was done from, by three Dutch researchers uh, where they asked uh, parties to talk to each other using only emojis. And then they went back and tried to characterize those emojis into what kind of em grammar function were they performing. They had four options, one unit grammar, linear grammar, simple phrase grammar, and categorical grammar. The details don't matter for you here. All that matters is that you'll notice that every single level of emojis, there was a mix of different grammar functions being performed. If you were using one emoji or you were using six plus, in all cases, it was possible that different grammars were being used by those emojis. So as a result, because there's no uniform grammar, there's lots of opportunities for miscommunicate to each other. The reader might be reading it with grammar A, the sender might have meant grammar B, and now when the, the, the emojis are read in context, they're still not communicating with each other because there's no uniform adopted grammar of how to interpret them. Let me give you some examples of this, again from the Dutch paper. Take a look at line E. Um, it's the uh, Paris, um, I'm sorry, the uh, Eiffel Tower. Um, it's two people with a heart, and then it's the heart eyes emoji three times with um, some question marks. Uh, the sender meant to say that the people were in, uh, was asking if the people were in love with each other. Uh, the recipient said, should these people go to Paris? They just straight out miscommunicated with each other. There wasn't a clear way to how to interpret the um, the sequence of emojis, there wasn't a uniform enough grammar for us to be able to understand them, uh, have a shared value. Take a look at I. Um, I is the same, uh, what's sometimes called the hugs emojis or the jazz hand emoji. Um, it's just uh, that same emoji five times, and the sender meant it to be aha. The recipient thought it meant playful or cheerful. 
Um, and so again, they just miscommunicated. There wasn't a clear sense of what do I do with these five emojis uh, together. The, the sender and recipient assigned different meanings to that uh, approach. Um, so this uh, problem with a lack of emoji grammar um, creates the, the opportunities for miscommunications. And when we have miscommunications, recognize from a legal standpoint, we could have a situation where the sender acted reasonably in sending what they sent, and the recipient acted reasonably in how they interpreted, they just got different things. So you've got a, a train wreck in motion in a situation like that, where the parties have each adopted reasonable interpretations of what they said, the reasonable interpretations are just different. Those are the kinds of things that are gonna end up in court cases. Um, okay, I wanna come back to the uh, cross-platform uh, incompatibility. This is the last major thing I'm gonna explain to you about why I think emojis are different than other communication technologies. Um, and I already gave you examples about this. Remember with the cow emoji or the um, uh, burrito emoji or the uh, eagle emoji. Remember how they were all a little bit different. Well, let's take a look at another emoji here. Um, we got the uh, grinning eyes with, um, uh, with a grinning face or smiling eyes with a grinning face. Um, these are how, at the very top is how they're all depicted at the time that the researchers did their research. And you would say that for the most part, even though there's some differences, like the Samsung one, it doesn't have as detailed teeth, and it's got eyebrows, uh, the Microsoft one's got more like metal mouth, um, but you would say that for the most part, you would probably treat them as equal. But then if you look back in time at how they have evolved over time, you can start to see some real horror stories here. So take a look at the Apple one, for example. You got up there the smiling eyes with a grinning mouth, and that same depiction in iOS 9, 8, and 6 had the smiling eyes with what you might say is a gritted teeth. Um, so the researchers did a study where they compared how people interpreted these two different emojis, uh, and the top emoji for Apple was interpreted as blissfully happy. And the bottom emoji, the one that was in the older one, was interpreted as ready to fight. So <laughs> if you are sending across Apple's operating system versions, you have the possibility that you're going to see one version and the other person's going to see a different version. And so even within Apple, not across the internet, but just within the Apple platform, there are still two different versions that are going to lead to radically different results. The sender is trying to send a friendly message. I'm blissfully happy right now. Sender gets us ready to fight. Back come the gun emojis. Back come the fist emojis, the knives emojis. Um, or if they run to each other in person, we literally have cases like this. Person sent me a ready to fight emoji, and then when I saw him in person, I shot him. Okay, no joke anymore. At this point now, we have people literally dying because they're, they're misunderstanding the emojis. Um, so, uh, so then you can also imagine if you sent uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Android 8.1 uh, emoji to the people who are back on the iOS, you've got the same problem. Now it's not within Apple, but the same problem again. The, the version you saw looks like it's a friendly emoji. The version they got is a ready to fight emoji. We're having the same problems. This, this cross-platform substitution is creating misunderstanding where there was no other reason for the misunderstanding. And I want to emphasize that, why this is so important. The technology is the one that's creating the misunderstandings. It's the mediation of the, what the sender sends and what the recipient gets and the fact that technology makes an undisclosed substitution of the emoji, so that's not the same thing, that creates the misunderstandings that are gonna be a problem. And I've been racking my brains to try and think of other examples where we have the technology causing the, the substitution of communication in a way that leads to misunderstandings. There really aren't many good examples. We can find some edge cases. If you have something I'm missing, I'd love to hear it. But for the most part, I think this is emoji specific and this is something courts may not be ready to appreciate that the technology is the culprit here, that, it, that everyone did everything right, it's the technology that made the, the substitution mistake. Now, the same researchers who did that previous study went and showed that chart to a bunch of Twitter users and said, hey, when you're using Twitter, here's what it might look like um, uh, to your recipients. And here's what they found. 25% didn't know that the emojis were going to be substituted. So a quarter of the users on Twitter had no idea that what they saw was going to be different than what the recipient saw. Now, some of you in the audience are like, Duh, what are you, a Gen Xer? Of course they're gonna be substituted. But many people still don't know today that that substitution is gonna take place. 
Furthermore, after seeing how the substitution was going to take place, 20% said they would have edited or not sent the emojis in the first place. That it, it so changed the meaning that they would have done something differently. And so the quote that they came out with in, in putting these stats together, across a huge data set of tweets, they said these statistics reflect millions of potentially regretful tweets shared per day because people cannot see emoji rendering differences across platforms. Millions of re potentially regretful tweets. Now what I see as a lawyer is cha-ching. Millions of regretful uh, tweets means lots of people who might want to sue each other. So this is great news for us. Woohoo! However, this is not great news for society. This is a problem, and it's a problem that we need to fix. And in the q and I'm happy to take your um, perspectives on, uh, I'm happy to engage with you on how we might fix it. So let's take a look at one of the examples of the substitution. This is the astonished emoji, and this is one of the worst emojis when it comes to cross-platform depiction diversity. So the version on the left is the Unicode outline. This is what they adopted as a standard depiction. And you can see that some of the other emoji depictions were similar to that. But take a look at some of the ones that aren't. So the third one from the left is the Google adoption. Now, I don't know what that means with the uh, asymmetrical eyes and mouth, but it doesn't mean astonished to me. I don't, whatever it means, it's not that. Um, and then take a look at the one on the uh, second from the right here. I don't know what that emoji is doing. That doesn't look astonished to me. That looks like someone is yelling. That's what I look like when I'm talking to my kids. Um, and of course, then the third from the right is the X's for eyes emojis. And as you may know, that's a well-known trope that signals either sickness or death. So you can imagine someone who sends the astonished emoji thinking, hey, I'm really astonished here. The recipient gets the one that says, someone is going to be exited with the eyes, and it might be you. Once again, the substitution has created that. Or here's another example. Some emojis are created by combining other emojis. It's called ZWJ. And the way you create the Jolly Roger pirate flag is by combining a gray flag with a skull and bones emoji. Now, as long as that combination works, you get the Jolly Rogers and everyone gets the point. It's talk like a pirate day or it's let's talk about uh, how we're going to uh, steal copyrighted works off the internet. Um, but if the ZWJ fails, the sender might have meant to say uh, Jolly Roger. The recipient might get this gray flag. That's weird. And then the skull and crossbones, another symbol of death. So once again, what might have been meant in a playful mood might end up being interpreted as a death threat. Okay, um, I'm getting near the end of my deck here, um, but we have a case study that I'm going to cover for a few minutes here. Um, as I mentioned, I, I read every emoji case I can find, um, and yeah, at this point I've read probably about 200 emoji cases. Um, the one that stands out as the most interesting is the case I'm going to show you on the next slide. It's an Israeli small claims court case. And because it's a small claims court case, it's not litigated the way that all of you would have litigated the case. So we don't get all the best stuff from it. But let's take a look at what happened in this case. So here's a message that a uh, prospective tenant sent to a landlord who advertised an apartment for uh, rent. And the rough hand translation is, good morning, with a smiley face, um, interested in the house, followed by six emojis, the Spanish dancer emoji, the uh, women dancing or the bunny ears emoji, the peace or um, uh, uh, victory uh, emoji, the comet emoji, the chipmunk emoji, and then the cork, uh, the bottle with cork popping or champagne emoji. And then following, uh, just need to discuss the details, when is a good time for you? You all know why went th this went to court. The tenant said, I want to take the place, and then didn't take the place. The landlord then sued the tenant because the, tenant, uh, because the landlord held the apartment off the market and lost some rent. Now, under US law, this is super easy. This is not a contract. Yes, everyone would agree with that. This did not constitute an acceptance or an offer. This was something in between. Um, and in the U.S., we don't have any kind of notion of bad faith negotiation or stringing along. We might have something like a promissory estoppel, and that's not this either. So in the U.S. Uh, court, uh, this, would, this would be a losing case by the landlord suing for the lost rent, caveat seller. Um, but in Israel, they have a notion of bad faith negotiation um, where the... Um, uh, 
uh, the notion is that if you string somebody along, the, if you, a customer strings a vendor along, the vendor might be able to recover for any bad faith negotiation in that. So the question is, how strongly did the tenant signal interest in the apartment based on this message? Well, we've got the smiley emoji. What is that smiley emoji selling, saying? The court said that was a symbol that they, the, the tenant was feeling like they were having a great day. Now, to me, that smiley is discourse management. That smiley is the equivalent of an exclamation mark or a period. It's designed as punctuation, not to symbol good effect, but discourse management. It's like, hey, I'm, having a, I'm, I'm sending you good vibes in my communication, but not, I'm going to take the apartment. So now, what do we do about Spanish dancer, the women dancing with bunny ears, the, the, the V uh, or P sign, uh, comet, chipmunk, and champagne? Um, now, at least three of those emojis we could say signal positive good intent, like celebratory things, like dancing is normally viewed as celebratory, so you got the uh, Spanish dancer and the uh, bunny ears, those are celebratory. Uh, the champagne uh, bottle, even in Israel, means the same thing. That's like you're celebrating something. Okay. Now, you could say that the, the peace sign would be like a V for victory. Maybe you could even say that that's celebratory. Okay. So the court said the emoji string was signaling that the, land, that the uh, tenant was celebrating the successful search for an apartment, and as a result, um, that was a signal of bad faith. Now, what about that comment emoji? And we can talk in the Q&A or offline if you want about how you could interpret the comment emoji as a, also signaling something positive. Um, but yeah, so you actually know, and comments are usually viewed as um, uh, harbingers of doom, so I'm not sure about that. But what about the chipmunk emoji? What about that damn chipmunk emoji? It screws everything up, doesn't it? <laughs> now, I've asked a lot of Israelis, do chipmunks have some special harbinger of good tidings in Israel? The answer is no. The Israelis are baffled by that too. You got a theory? What? Squirrel what? A founder's nut. Okay, so I'm sorry, I have to be that guy, but I will get chewed out if I don't. It is not a squirrel, it is a chipmunk, and it makes a difference. <laughs> I'm sorry guys, I gotta tell you this, it is a chipmunk, it's not a squirrel. Um, okay, so you can do that. I've heard other theories like, um, you know, it's a place that it could store its nut or whatever. Um, here's what I'm gonna do for you. I literally will meet the sender of this text when I go to Israel in December. I've established contact, I have sent emails saying, tell me what that chipmunk is about, and I can't get the answer by email. But I will find out for you. In December, I will get the answer to this. I still do not know. Could it be possible, just throwing out a theory, could it be possible that the chipmunk was being facetious? Okay, just bear me out for a moment. If it were facetious, it would flip the meaning of everything, wouldn't it? Yes? We have to give effect to all emojis. We don't get to cherry pick out the ones that we like and ignore the other ones. You gotta give effect to all of them. The court needs to say that chipmunk emoji is a harbinger of good tidings, or it might be the direct opposite. And notice because we don't have a grammar for how to interpret these, we don't know. Are these designed to be duplicative? Are they designed to be additive? Are they designed to be uh, some other thing? Are they meant to be a sentence? We actually don't know. I will know, December, I have a meeting scheduled with the sender, and I will get you that answer. However, today I still don't know. Here's what the court said. The court said that uh, per Israeli law, the prospective tenant negotiated bad faith because an um, emoji signaled optimism and positive intent. Landlord got 2,200 bucks from that. 2,200 bucks, God, somebody balled up per hour. Okay, um, so uh, here's some takeaways, some things I hope you got from today's talk. Um, and I've got a few minutes that I'm gonna be able to reserve for questions. Emojis look different over time. Emojis look different on different platforms. So emojis should always come in at least pairs. What the sender saw, what the recipient saw. At the time they were sent, not when you pull it up in your e-discovery request, where you might be substituting in just like the, this system took away my emoji with the prayer hands. It's, I had a different symbol there. It substituted out on me. Um, just like that, you have to go back in time and say, what was it depicting at that time, not today? Emojis come in pairs. Please remember that. 
you have to give effect to the emojis in the conversation. They are an integral part. I see court opinions where they'll just take out the emojis, say emoji to, op, omitted, like they weren't part of the conversation. Hello, absolutely they're part of the conversation. They could be flipping the meaning of the entire conversation. You can't omit the emojis. Emojis can perform different functions in the same sentence. So if the judge comes in, well, the smiley emoji is always meant to do X, you're like, it could be Y or Z. And here's all the different ways in which it could work. And finally, you may not be in charge of this, but this is my request to all the judges. The emojis have to be in the opinion. Please don't cut them out. They are part of the communication. Literally, judges exclude them. Um, so I have six minutes for Q&A. I don't know uh, if we have a microphone that's going to be run or if you're going to have to shout out loud, but I'm going to take your uh, questions and comments right now. And I can't see so well in the back, but we'll take the one up here. How about that? Loud and proud, please. So the comment was... I think, I think we, that's designed to be a gotcha, yes? Designed to be a gotcha. So uh, the um, comment was that on the LG, if you uh, do squirrel or chipmunk, you get the same symbol. Um, and in fact, uh, operating systems and platforms do suggest emojis based on text. It's their construction of what emojis are equivalent. It's not necessarily what the design was meant to be. And I will assure you, I'm so sorry, but you guys are lawyers. You know how important words are. The chipmunk people, no, it is a chipmunk, and no, it is not a squirrel. And you're just pouring gasoline on the fire if you, uh, if you call a squirrel to them. Um, other uh, questions or comments? Yes. Or on the iPhone, you can do the ha-ha emoji, which is what I normally do to the kids to taunt them. Um, so, uh, so the comment was that in addition to emojis being part of the text, there are also um, uh, the platforms might give you the opportunity to use some emoji-like depictions to react to the text. Um, so for example, on Facebook now, you can do things like love or thumbs up or uh, the, the sad face or the angry face, which is what I use on all news items today is the angry face. In fact, I've like worn that button out. Um, so, um, uh, so I don't really have a good model for how to deal with those differently. And they're, they are different in at least one respect. You can't use the full menu of options. Right, you only use the ones that are preset by the platform that allow you to communicate that. We have had cases that touch on this issue. Some of you may be familiar with, for example, the guy who worked in a sheriff's office who liked a message by the, his boss's opponent. And then the boss is like, out you go. You want a thumbs up? How about a thumbs out? Um, and literally fired him for liking his opponent's um, Facebook message. And that was viewed as a, an expression of speech that was therefore not appropriate basis for firing, and so it was literally an illegal firing by using that. Um, that's about the best I got for you on that one. We haven't seen any other developments of how the, um, uh, the react emojis as reactions um, could change the analysis. It's a great question, though, and something I'm, I'm going to be interested in watching. Uh, next question. Yeah, so the, the observation was that some companies have taken the position that emojis are off limits in professional co correspondence. Um, uh, that can include externally facing messages like um, uh, marketing. It could also include internal messages among uh, employees. And the main justification is because emojis are still subject to a lot of variability in how people are interpreting them. There's a lot of context that um, is required. There's lots of potential for misunderstanding. I personally think that anyone who bans emojis is like, like 
you know, but why don't you go kick some puppies while you're at it? Um, you're taking away such an integral part of how we communicate. How could you do that? It would break my heart. I couldn't even talk anymore. And it's so millennial unfriendly. It's like, hey, welcome to the company. You can't actually talk like a millennial anymore. We're going to take away that opportunity for you. Um, so, uh, but, but go ahead and talk uh, amongst yourself anyway. Um, many of the cases that I see um, involve intra employee conversations like sexual harassment or racial harassment or discrimination. Um, emojis are coming up in them. They also pose a problem for e-discovery. So there's lots of opportunity for e-discovery vendors to think carefully about how emojis are being integrated into the, uh, into the, um, uh, the software tools. Um, but I personally think that's a huge overreaction. Um, yes, emojis are susceptible to misunderstandings. Um, that is a, a risk, um, but the gains are so much better. I'll take the last question from Eli here. Yes, ma'am. The question is whether anyone's been defamed by emoji, um, and I have not seen a case like that. But I have seen cases where a defamation lawsuit was dismissed because of the fact that an emoji was able to qualify or undermine the message. So, for example, if you put the winky face or the winky emoticon after a message, you can say pretty much whatever you want and it won't be defamatory. So that is perhaps the last and most important takeaway I can offer for you. Thank you very much. <laughs>